to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father to Jesus. Be power and glory forever and ever. Amen. Word of God for our consideration today are our words of the gospel lesson. Uh, Luke chapter 5, we heard them read a, a moment ago. I'll uh, read just the introduction to the lesson here f- to uh, get us back into the text. As the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear God's word, he was standing by Lake Gennesaret, which you probably know as the Sea of Galilee. He saw two boats at the edge of the lake. The fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the land. Then he sat down and was teaching the crowds from the boat. This was God's word. To brothers and sisters in Christ, social media has changed the way we get our news and information. We can follow people who interest us on things like Facebook, and when we press that follow button, then what happens? Their news, their pictures show up in our own news feed. Uh, we will get pictures of their, their children and their family events and maybe cute pictures of kittens. We keep up with them this way, and you probably know this is one of the ways I keep up with my own granddaughter's life and development. But it's not just limited to friends and family, is it? You you can follow famous people on social media. You can follow them on Twitter or Facebook. And there you will be able to see the lives of celebrities. They, They will let you in on their latest fashion design and dress. Uh, They will allow you to go with them as they vacation in uh, luxury in some exotic location. (laughs) You'll probably be treated to a a large dose of their political views, which you probably need to take with a grain of salt. But once again, you don't have to physically follow them around like the paparazzi In order to know what's going on in their lives, you can follow them online remotely in this way. During Jesus' ministry, it always seemed like he had people following him, right? (laughs) There, they were physically following him where he went. He he tended to attract a crowd. I've sometimes wondered, maybe you have. Why were they able to do this? Where did they all come from? I mean, didn't these people have jobs? But nonetheless, they, they are, there they are where Jesus is, listening to what he has to say, seeing him perform his miracles. And you know, we, we need to follow Jesus too. We, we, we don't have to physically follow him, of course, like those crowds did, but we don't have to. We have the opportunity to follow him in his word. We can hear him speaking to us here. <laughs> And more important than keeping up with uh, what's going on in the lives of our family, uh, what's going on in the lives of our favorite entertainers, is knowing what Jesus has to say. When Jesus speaks, follow him. And as you do, understand that when Jesus has something to say about something, Well, he will draw a crowd, he will bless your life, and he will change your heart. Jesus was actually having a problem with the crowd that was gathering around to hear him teach God's word here at the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, But for you and me, there uh, is an important lesson that we can take from the behavior of that crowd. As a crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear God's word, he was... Standing by Lake Gennesaret, he saw two boats at the edge of the lake. The fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the land. Then he sat down and was teaching the crowds from the boat. It's a little hard to preach and to teach when there's not a little distance between the the speaker and the audience. I mean, I see that none of you picked these seats to sit in today, right? It's it's, it's a little hard to... uh, 
take in what's going on when you're looking up the speaker's nose. And if we had a little more room in our sanctuary here, but perhaps we would put a little bit more distance between the front row and the pulpit still. We maybe put the pulpit up on a, on a, on a platform of some sort. And then you, you have the, the speaker's voice project better. And you can see the gestures and the facial expressions that help to communicate the message more clearly. Now, Jesus had this crowd pressing around him. And on the one hand, that's a good thing. They wanted to hear God's word. But, but they were so pressed against him in this case that they were right up against his body. It would have been difficult to see or hear just a couple of bodies back. And so Jesus' solution to this problem of all these people following him so closely because they wanted to hear God's word was, was really rather clever to get in that boat, to, to put out a little bit into the sea to create that distance. Well, I mean, the people who weren't likely to trudge through the water then but that pr presented a, a, a natural barrier. It, it gave him that natural distance so that he could address the crowd uh, more, more, more clearly and visibly. The, the, the surface of the water, if it was a reasonably calm day on the sea that day, and as it would appear from what we see that it was, would also serve as a surface that would uh, allow his voice to carry to the people on the shore. We, we don't know exactly how many people were there. Luke says it was enough to call it a crowd, 200 years ago, we know that uh, the uh, evangelist George Whitfield was able to address as many as 25,000 people in the open air at once without the benefit of speakers and an amplifier, uh, just with the ability to project his voice. And so here we trust that Jesus now had the, the setting in which he could properly teach the people. And his teaching had drawn this crowd. Now, I don't think this lesson is included for us in Luke's gospel, primarily to teach us that we need to create acoustically uh, appropriate environments for preaching and teaching. We wouldn't need to be told so. Nor do I believe it is merely background for the miracle that's going to take place later. Matthew and Mark in their gospels don't choose to include this part of the detail. So what do we have here? This has more to say about the power and the appeal of Jesus and his word. It wants to give us the confidence that he and his word will draw the crowd. Sometimes we start to lose faith in that, don't we? We're not so sure about it. We, we, we know from the gospels that Jesus' teaching uh, was uh, certainly impressive to the people who heard it in his day. You remember the phrase that they used that he taught as one who had authority and not like their teachers of the law. They were impressed with the way that Jesus delivered the message and the things that he had to say. And in order to do that, understand that, that Jesus did not water down his message for the people. He, he was not feeding them uh, something uh, sugary and sentimental and just pious platitudes. Sometimes the message he delivered was on hard topics and controversial issues. And when he delivered his message, often it was in a hard-hitting way that, that, that you know, hit people right between the eyes. And what he had to say to them was presented very clearly. But, but more than that, Jesus had the confidence that when he preached the gospel, that when he focused on God's grace... That, that, that was not going to be a topic that drove the crowds away. That, that was not going to be something that bored those who came to hear them or that, that would, we'd lead them over time to determine that, you know, Jesus just was not relevant to their lives. No, he took that grace of God. He took the message about forgiveness of sins and he made that the centerpiece of his ministry for three years. He, he announced it to cripples, who were laid before him to be healed and people who were caught in the act of adultery and to 
social outcasts and morally questionable people who were struggling to change their lives. He, he illustrated it in one parable after another. He revealed that this was the very purpose for which he had come and that it was the reason for which he was now going to go to his death. Jesus preached God's grace. He told the people their sins are forgiven, as he tells us today. And maybe that didn't win everyone to his side. It didn't convince everyone who heard it and bring them to faith. Uh, we, we hear again in the Gospels that some reacted by saying, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? But even if it wasn't met with faith, it was still not met with a yawn. It drew them, it drew the crowds when Jesus spoke. So, we look around us here. Where are they? So many empty seats. Maybe sometimes we get the idea we have to spice things up a little bit more. Or maybe we're too, maybe we, we fret about saying that from God's law, people are bad. And that sometimes we have to confront and we have to express our disagreement with so many of the sacred cows in our culture. We, we see that some other churches seem to find a certain amount of success by, by, by trading a, a message of grace and forgiveness for, uh, of sin and grace for a message that has more to do with just giving uh, sanctified practical advice. Don't do it. Don't give up. Don't give up on the power of Jesus' word to draw a crowd when Jesus speaks. We need to follow him. We need to say the same things that Jesus said and still says to us today from his word. Maybe we're too concerned about what happens here in this location. I mean, Jesus went to church every week just like you do. He was his regular practice to be in the synagogue on each Saturday. But, you know, I don't remember reading from the gospel that he packed the synagogue. In the lesson that we have before us today, we find him where? On the seashore, just as the fishermen are getting off work after a hard night's work. In other places in the gospels, he's preaching and teaching where? On, in the wheat fields or on a hillside or at a neighbor's dinner party or in the marketplace in the village. Maybe what we need is to get out there. Maybe that's where our crowd is. Like the lady who came to me this past fall at the county fair and came up to our booth and said to me that, you know, what she really wanted was someone, just someone, who would tell her what the words in this book mean. Maybe it's in the waiting room at the doctor's office, like the lady who said to me a week ago that, well, asked me actually the question whether God could forgive her for her divorce. Maybe it's in the nursing home, like the lady who called me just this past Friday night and asked if I could come and share some of God's comfort with uh, the people who live there who are mourning Mike McKenna's death this past week. Maybe they work where you work. They shop where you shop. They eat and drink and play where you hang out. There are over 50,000 people in the city of Norman who don't have any connection to Jesus who are not presently following him. That's more than half the total population. That, my friends, is a crowd. 
when Jesus speaks, follow him, says what he says, and don't give up faith that when we do, it will draw a crowd for him. Peter found another advantage of following Jesus when he speaks. He will bless your life. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let your nets down for a catch. Master, Simon replied, we've worked hard all night long and caught nothing. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they did this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Peter, as you know, was an experienced fisherman. He, he, he didn't do this for sport like some of my friends do on the weekend. This was how he made his livelihood. This was his living. Jesus was a carpenter. What did Jesus know about fishing? What did he have to teach this experienced fisherman? We might see that Peter had some reason to be a little skeptical about the advice Jesus was giving him here. I'm a husband and a father. Jesus was a single man his entire life. So far as we know, he never went on a date with a girl. What would be the point? So, why should I think that he has something to say to me about getting along in a marriage or raising my children or interacting with and dating a woman or finding a spouse? He didn't do any of those things. Why should we want to follow him when he... He speaks on those topics. And we could, we could cre create an almost endless list of these differences between Jesus' life and ours, right? I mean, as I look out at you today, who am I addressing? I am speaking to homeowners and security guards and engineers and managers and retirees. Some of you were soldiers once. Farmers. Uh, you, you have bank accounts and money in investments, perhaps. Half of you, about, are women. So what does Jesus know about all of this? What does he know about our lives? What does he know about me? Everything, it turns out. He knows everything about you and me. And, and he has the word of life that we need to trust. What did Peter find? Peter found that when Jesus speaks, he blesses our lives. Even if we don't think it makes much sense at the time, there is that sense in Peter's way of addressing Jesus, isn't there? If you say so, But even if what Jesus doesn't, says doesn't seem to make much sense to us, still, what he tells us will bless our lives. That doesn't mean that everything he tells us is going to result in an endless string of successes and happiness. Even Peter here found what? He, he discovered that uh, in uh, the blessing that Jesus was trying to give him, uh, there was uh, hard work and labor, the nets began to break, uh, the, the, the two boats began to sink. There was anxiety, no doubt, and fear, and, and stress, and, and maybe some physical exhaustion trying just to get the fish into the boats and safely back to the shore. But still the blessing, so many fish, so much, And so Peter found, as we should too, that when you follow Jesus, when, when, when you hear him speak, it makes sense to follow him because it results in our life's blessing. Jesus' words brought Peter no greater blessing than when he changed his heart. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me because I am a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's partners. 
Peter didn't look like such a bad guy, did he? Uh, he was a hard-working man who took care of his family's needs. He was a person genuinely interested in spiritual things. This is not the first time he meets Jesus. We find in John's gospel that he had met Jesus sometime earlier down in Judea when Peter was either a follower of John the Baptist, his, his brother Andrew was for sure, or perhaps they were just there in Judea away from home because it was one of the pilgrim festivals of the Jewish people. But either way, we find that, that Peter was a man who uh, took his faith seriously, who, who practiced the, uh, the spiritual practices of the Jewish people. Uh, Jesus had already named this man, Simon, at Peter, the, 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 the rock, by the time we meet him here. He, he followed his Jewish faith, and he was concerned about spiritual things. You don't look like such bad people. Not from the outside. You've held down jobs. You've taken care of your families. Yeah, you're, you're not in trouble with the law. At least not recently, so far as I know. You're, you're here at church on a Sunday morning. You, you care about faith. You care about spiritual things. You, you listen to God's word. Generally, you and I are a picture of good citizens. Peter even did what Jesus asked him, right? He, he might have had some skepticism, but he still did it. But Peter saw that when his skepticism was confronted with the, the goodness and power and divinity of Jesus, that he gained a new perspective on himself and his life. He saw it all in a different light. I am a sinful man. He doesn't use a softer word for sinful. It is the same word applied in the Gospels to the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the uh, uh, other public sinners of their day. He, he doesn't see himself as a, as, a, as a different class of sinner, but he recognized that uh, while on the outside he may not look so different, finally that is the point. There is no difference. We all may sin against God in different ways, but we are sinners nonetheless. And isn't that we all confessed just about 30 minutes ago now at the beginning of the liturgy? I am by nature sinful. I have sinned against you in my thoughts, in my words, and in my actions, our change of heart begins when we see the divinity, power, and goodness of Jesus and come to grips with our own sin. Then we hear his response, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, he told Simon. From now on, you will be catching people. Don't be afraid. He is not telling Peter, stop doing something bad. What he's saying to Peter is the gospel. It's good news. You don't have to be afraid, Peter. I've not come to condemn you. I've come to save you. I've come to bring you my forgiveness and grace and peace. Look here. Right now, your sin is so forgiven that the relationship between you and me is so restored that I am inviting you to come and to catch other hearts with that same forgiveness and grace and peace. Follow me. Follow me. And we do so because he changes our hearts. Grace changes us. And once it has changed our hearts and it changes our lives as well. Then they brought the boats to land, left everything, and followed him. It delivers us from fear to faith. It delivers us from despair to hope. And as it changed Peter, it changes you and me as well. We follow him as Peter did. Jesus will lead us on some grand adventures through this life. Sometimes the road is rough. The journey is hard, even painful. But Jesus' blessing lies along that road for us all the way. And Jesus himself will be with us in his word to guide us all the way. He doesn't ask us to go anywhere that he himself has not already gone. 
So hear his word. And when Jesus speaks, follow him. Amen. Please stand.